There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Well, hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I'm outside. I had a small enough number of books that I needed to carry, and I didn't need to carry my chair, and it's a beautiful day. A little bit cloud cover, which means I'm not squinting as much as I will be if those clouds disappear <laughs> before I finish my Friday read. So here I am, al fresco again. I've had a, a great week, especially last weekend. Last weekend was one of the most uh, literarily stimulating weekends in recent memory. So let me tell you about it. Mom and I went to a book launch at McNally's, which is the closest bookstore to my house, or one of the closest bookstores to my house. The other one's a chain, although this one's a chain too, but it's a, supposedly an independent chain, and I love it. McNally Robinson's. And they have lots of book launches. Pretty much any time I've talked about a book launch, since I've moved back to Saskatoon, it's been at McNally's. So I hummed and hawed about whether I wanted to go to this one, because I'd never heard of the author, and it Sounded like it might not be that interesting. And I said to mom, well, do you want to go? Well, let's go. Why not? What's the worst that could happen? We'll be bored for an hour. Well, I'm so glad I went. Mom and I were so stimulated by the end of it. It is for this posthumous debut novel, The School of the Haunted River by Colleen Gerwing. Colleen Gerwing died a couple years ago, and she had this almost finished. The writer in residence that she had worked with while she was writing it, by that time she was no longer the writer in residence, she finished it, but it was, she said it was really finished, but she just, you know, did a few, few edits at the end. Her name is Dee Hobsbawm Smith, and she was wonderful. So there were three people on the panel at the reading, Dee Hobsbawm Smith and Colleen Gerwing's life partner, Marianne Rot Rotger, Rotger, and Colleen Gerwing's sister. I don't have that name in my head. And all three ladies were so incredibly fascinating. They were all in their, well, I think maybe a D, Hobsman Smith, would be the youngest. And she's maybe in the 50s or 60s, I don't know. But the other two were into their 70s and full of so much energy and so much love for Colleen Gerwing. And the room was packed. They even changed the layout of the room because just to accommodate more people. So Colleen Gerwing was a much beloved naturalist and outdoors woman, outdoors woman, and very well known. She was a pioneering explorer, naturalist, camper. She did solo camping winter and summer, and she taught classes and mentored women to, to experience the joys of, of uh, solo camping, again, winter, summer, or maybe even fall and spring, and just really made a name for herself. She sounds like she was an absolutely incredible person, and she's written this autobiographical novel, which is about a winter snowshoeing trip in northern Saskatchewan with the protagonist and her niece. And there's lots of storytelling and so on. This is published by a vanity publisher, Endless Sky Books, that I'd never heard of. And I'm usually really um, suspicious, or not suspicious, I'm usually quite cynical about stuff that is self-published like that. But Several excerpts were read from it. I'll put the link to the video. It's actually because they rearranged the room, the lighting, and maybe even the audio is better. So if you want to have a peek at the video of the event, you, you can check it out in the show notes. I loved the excerpts that were read. So I think this might be a new chapter in my adventures as a reader. Um, don't discount self-published stuff. Don't discount stuff that was written at the end of someone's life when they were ill that was finished by somebody else, I don't think I've ever discounted that. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I've, I'm starting to be open to narratives that come into the, into the world that way. And this one sounds amazing. Even if I don't end up liking the book, and I have a feeling I'm going to like the book, but even if I don't, it was just one of the most beautiful literary book launches I have ever been to. I talked to the uh, editor who is no longer the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library, Dee Hobsbawm Smith, but she is now Saskatchewan's poet laureate, very recently named. When I invited her to come on my channel, she sounded interested in that, so you may be seeing her eventually. She lives just outside Saskatoon. So I loved that experience, and Mum and I were just, we had trouble, I think I had trouble sleeping that night. I was so stimulated. Well, that overstimulation continued because the next morning, I was a guest again. I think it's my third appearance on the 
fabulous bookish podcast, Bookcast Club, that um, I've become friends with Sarah from that podcast, and there are other co-hosts, including um, Chris, Chris Bookish Cauldron and Jenny. So Sarah and Jenny and I, and as I said last week, I bailed on the book that we were going to discuss, so we didn't discuss that. Instead, we discussed three st- short stories. I'll keep you in suspense about the rest of it. I think it launches a week from today. I think I'm getting a version to, to put on my channel. If not, I'll certainly put it in the show notes next week. But it was so fun. I enjoyed it so much. I, it just, everything just gelled. It was just literary bliss, people. Oh, speaking of bliss, here's my new blouse I forgot to mention. It's nothing special, but uh, I like it. It's uh, one of those $18, um, you know, low cut. So it's, it's good for, for a Friday night. <laughs> Friday morning, too. I have one more flashy one coming in the mail. And then now it's time for Sean the Book Maniac to retrench because my budget is... <laughs> The income situation has suddenly turned rather dire, but I'm not going to get into that. And I loved doing that podcast episode, and then, the next day, I talked to the Nigerian bookstagrammer, Nimika, and we agreed, because I can't pronounce that first part of his name, it's got uh, the way that it's pronounced, the, the way the N is pronounced, it is, I can't do it, I just, I just can't, he and I agreed that... From now on, I will call him Emeka. That first part of the name, he said it's not necessary. He doesn't use it always. So Emeka. So Emeka and I talked about the debut queer Nigerian novel. And then he sang a lullaby by Annie Kayode Samtochuku. And uh, we had a great discussion. And spoiler alert, I, I'm not going to keep it a secret anymore. We both loved the novel. It's one of the best queer debut novels I've read in a long time. So that discussion is coming to a booktube channel near you, uh, hopefully this week, but certainly as soon as I can get it edited. So those three things just filled me with joy. So life is beautiful. That's it for personal news. Here is the weekend review. Yeah, I thought it was a really, really good book. I actually was quite surprised that it hadn't been published until now. When you said I read a, a book called The Inseparables, my heart just sank because I read a really shitty novel called The Inseparables by <laughs> Stuart Nadler. Oh, you just, don't like that one? <laughs> and I, I don't know if he stole the title from, from Simone de Beauvoir or what, but I thought, oh my God, I hope you didn't like that novel. It was terrible. So a different book. <laughs> In the early 14th century, curfew spelled this way meant evening signal or the ringing of a bell at a fixed hour. And the signal was to put out your fires and lights. And this medieval practice, usually the bell was rung at about 8 or 9 p.m., was in order to bank the hearths and prepare for sleep so that people, whether they were drunk or just worked to the bone, too tired, wouldn't fall asleep with the fire burning and start a fire. That's the original meaning of curfew. Curfew goes back to Anglo-French, Couverfew from the late 13th century, which goes back to Old French, very similar version, couvrefou, meaning cover fire. I used to have my Goodreads connected to Facebook, so every time I'd update anything, it would spit out a post on Facebook, and so every 10 pages I would read, there'd be a Facebook <laughs> post, and you know, I'm spending eight, eight hours a day reading, and every <laughs> 10 pages, oh, my poor Facebook friends. I disabled like that. Their big brother watching in on you. <laughs> well, they were getting all the, you know, and their large Facebook posts that take up their whole screen. That John has now read twelve percent of David Cloverfield, <laughs> whatever it is. So I got got rid of that part of it. How long have you been tracking your reading? Did you track your reading differently before Goodreads and all that stuff, or is this fairly somewhat new? Mm, I don't. Re- I honestly don't remember a time before Goodreads. <laughs> well, that's that says it all, really. All right, so for my book report, I have finished three books. No, that's not right. And in the next sentence, I attempt to correct myself, and I intended to say I've finished two books, but I said again that I've finished three books. Math is not my strong suit. What can I say? I have finished three books, and I'm going to tell you about three, maybe four books that I've gotten quite a ways into, and I'm going to start a bunch. So let's talk about the books that I finished. I don't... Did I bail on anything this week? No, I was in too good of a mood. I have some potential bails that I haven't picked up for a couple of weeks, so I, I may be a, 
a blitz of bales next week. But for this week, I have some books that were completely or at least partially positive. So let's start with the partially positive in that I didn't hate this novel from Italy, The Dry Heart. I'll put the, they've got the label over the title, I'm going to put up the gif. The Dry Heart by Natalia Ginsberg, translated from the Italian by Francis Frenet. I read this because it was the summer book for the summer book club of Mooks and the Gripes, and I just finished it a couple days ago, and I haven't had time to listen to the episode. I'm assuming that everybody there loved it. I didn't love it, but there were things I did really like about it. I gave it four stars, and as you know, in my curious, eccentric corner of the universe, a <laughs> four-star read is not that great of a book. There was things about it that I couldn't fault so it's four stars, but it wasn't particularly a Sean book. However, I hated her other, one of her other novels that I read, probably for Women in Translation Month four or five years ago, Family Lexicon, which I thought was an annoying collection of character ticks and no story and no real character work other than just character ticks. It, it just bugged me. I didn't finish it. This one had a story and the character work was interesting. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't completely Sean book. I'm glad I read it, and enjoy is not the word, but yeah, I got quite a bit out of it. So, four stars. This was originally published in Italian in 1947. Translation, 1952. I'll put a link to the episode of The Mooks and the Grapes, which I look forward to listening to, hopefully this weekend, and finding out what everybody else thought. It's about an unhappy marriage, and a couple of really unhappy characters, and I think because I didn't really get in invested in the characters, that kind of made it not an optimal reading experience. They were so annoying, each in their own way, and they were kind of pulled together by circumstance. Neither one of them knew their own selves, and that's why they ended up together, and I think that's a, possibly a profound statement on how most of us find each other because we don't really know ourselves, so we don't know who would be good for us, and it was a disastrous marriage. What I enjoyed more than anything was the weirdness of it, which was different than the ticks in Family Lexicon. They were just interesting things about the characters that I just wondered, why is this in here? And that's what kept me going. So, for example, and this maybe isn't the best example because it's not that weird, but the husband, he kept sketching people and sketching things, but he wasn't an artist. It was just kind of a little bit above doodling, but it was a key aspect of his character that played an important role in the story. Everybody was kind of in love with somebody else, in a way, except the the, the protagonist. Is it first person? Yes, the first per... Yeah, the first person protagonist. I don't think she's named. No, I don't believe she's named, but it would be just like me to have missed her name. Um, she's not in love with anybody else. She just is so unself-aware that she's kind of an idiot. But everybody else was kind of more in love with somebody else and there was this all this stuff going on and uh, one of the husband's best friends and they had been both been in love with this, the same woman and that friend he was writing history history of poland and history of the early christian church or something and it was just like why is this in here it's fascinating but i just those were the things that's like surprised and delighted me about it the dry heart yes there were a lot of dry hearts in here there's going to be a sizable percentage of people who are watching that like translated fiction and maybe Italian fiction uh, don't care about getting emotionally invested in this story that would enjoy this far more and I expect many of those are going to be the people who are contributing to this episode of the Moose and the Gripes but I read it glad I read it enough said much more positive was this novel that I started for the Asian readathon when the hell was that April I can't remember. May anyway I finally finished it and loved it this novel from Canada Dandelion by Jamie Chai Yun Lu. Lindy passed this on to me, and am I ever glad she did? I read it very slowly and just loved it. It was a 2022 debut novel by Lu, who is a lawyer, and it's very autobiographical. I haven't read the author's afterward, I probably won't, and it really sang for me. It's a debut novel. I gave it five stars because it was a debut novel. Probably if it hadn't been, then I would have found fault, but I, I can't even think of what I didn't like about it. It was maybe a little bit 
could have been pared down just a wee bit or something, but no, I found it all really fascinating. I, I thought the characters jumped off the page. Some of the storylines maybe didn't get satisfactorily resolved, but who cares about that? Not me. <laughs> when the characters are interesting and, and, vi and uh, three or four dimensional, I don't care about plot really at all. But there is a lot of story here. An Asian Canadian family, immigrant family, the parents came to Canada in the 80s maybe a little bit earlier than the 80s, I'm not sure, but the story opens in 1987 in a small town in British Columbia, and the parents came from Brunei, which I didn't know anything about. I didn't know anything but, about Brunei, but, but it has a large Malay Chinese population, and so these parents, they were Malay Chinese in Brunei, and they were oppressed. The mother had Brunei citizenship, but the father never did, and that was a bone of contention between them, and a sore point in the in the marriage. The, in Canada, the father is working at a mine. I think it's a mine. You can tell how much I cared about that part of the plot. I think it was a mine. And the mother is so unhappy. She doesn't like Canada, so I liked her because Canada's not that likable of a place. And she's just really unhappy in an interesting way. She's a pretty good mother, and she her character was really well-rounded. Our protagonist is Lily, who's 11 years old when the story opens. And I'm not going to say very much more about the plot because it is it's something you just need to experience for yourself. But we follow Lily into her married life when she has a kid. And there has been, there's a lot of mother issues, that's all I'm going to say about it, read the book, that really surface for her when she has her own daughter. And so there's a journey of exploration about her own mother at that point in the story, which is the end of the story. And I just thought it all worked beautifully. There's so much food in here and so much Chinese culture, Malay Chinese Brunei. What's the demonym for Brunei? I don't know. Culture. Very vivid, very colorful. Could have been shaped a bit more, I suppose, but I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So I recommend it very highly. And that's actually kind of too much. That color is kind of too much, but it's also kind of my favorite color. So you notice my glasses so, and I have, over time I've had uh, iPad covers this color and phone covers and oh my goodness, jackets and stuff. So yeah. <laughs> so those are what I've finished. I hope I'm not forgetting something. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but no, those are what I've finished. I'm going to talk about three, and if I might talk about a fourth one that's on ebook, or I might leave that for another day, because I'm not sure, I, even though I'm a, a ways into it, that I'm ready to talk about it. First of all, I'm reading Barbara Pym's debut novel, Some Tame Gazelle, to my Bibliophile Bestie tier patron, Robin from California. And I just started this week. I've read three chapters. It's Robin's first Barbara Pym novel. And this is the one she chose for me to read to her. And oh boy, am I ever delighted to be reading it to her. We're having a really good time with it. It's as good the second time around as it was the first. And upset about that. On a completely <laughs> different note, I have started this buddy read for Women in Translation Month of this short story collection from India with Joe Smith. It's called Breast Stories by Mahaswata Devi. Translated from the Bengali by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. We checked in on the first story yesterday, and it's enough of the book because there's only three stories that I, I'm dying to, to check in on a preliminary basis now. It was a very difficult story, and by the time I got to the end, I was kind of, I was obliterated by it. Mahaswata Devi was an activist. She died, I believe, in 2016, born in 1926. Yeah, she was 90 when she died. And she came from the upper caste, the Brahmin caste, and she devoted her life to advocacy and political and social work and writing about the poor and the underclasses, the untouchables in that terrible word that we're not supposed to use anymore, the Dalit class and so on. Joe and I decided not to read the introduction. Not only is there an introduction to this collection by the translator, there's also a translator's introduction to the story, and we opted not to read those. I think I want to read them later. But Joe had read this same story in another, I think, an anthology, and there was a shorter introduction about Mahaswata Devi there, and I also went to her Wikipedia page. She sounded like an incredible, incredible person. I've kind of developed, based on one story only, I, I have developed a Mahaswata Devi obsession. She was so political. I'm always drawn to fictional narratives that 
are immersed in politics in a way that doesn't detract from the fictional story, but enhances it. And this is definitely one. The protagonist of the first story, which was called Aldropity, is a freedom fighter, I believe, with the Naxalite Maoist forces that were fighting on behalf of the peasants in West Bengal and connected states. I'm not sure of the era, I believe the 1970s. And the first half of the story is from the perspective of the government and military, which is trying to capture all of these Maoists. And you know me, I'm as anti-communist as they come, but there are nuances to my anti-communism. And there were nuances to Mahaswat, from what I've read now, about the author, Mahaswat Devi, there were nuances to her communism. And she was as vociferous in her opposition to the communists in power as she was to other forms of autocracy and oppression. But these freedom fighters were fascinating. And there's a husband and wife. Dropity is the wife. Her husband has already been murdered. And she is trying to evade capture. The first half of the story is about the people that are trying to capture her. And it's very satirical. And the way the use of language in this translation was just comedic and taught with political implications. And then we, as Joe pointed out to me, I don't know if I would have noticed, but Joe said the language gets so much more simplified in the second half of the story when we're with Dropity as she is trying to ev evade capture and her ferocity. Just It was just, I'm not going to say any more about the story, but it bowled me over. So I can't wait to keep reading this. And I'm so glad that Joe Smith put Mahaswata Devi on my radar. I sent her a Voxer message this morning saying, now that I've thought about this story overnight, I think I have a bit of a Mahaswata Devi obsession. Tell me what you've already read, and I will read that to catch up to you, and I hope we can read more of her stuff together in the future. I'm 40 pages into Frost in May by Antonia White. This was is put on my reading calendar this month because of the book spin on Litzy, which is similar to what Rick McDonnell had been doing on YouTube. You make a list of 20 books and then they get two numbers are picked and those are the books you read. So this is one of mine for July. This was first published in 1933. Apparently very autobiographical. It's about a young British girl who, whose um, father wants her to be educated in a Catholic convent in the UK. I guess he wants her to become a nun. He's a convert. I think the mother is not a Catholic convert. And so that's already a, quite a dynamic in the story. The, the novel opens with her being taken, with her dad taking her to the convent. And within 15 pages, 12 pages, you can see the darkness of the convent life. You know, you can see some well-meaning people and some nasty girls. How old is she when she arrives? 10, maybe. Maybe 9 or 8. Mm, 10 uh, would be my guess, but you know me. I know she's not... <laughs> 30. She's a child. Her parents come to visit 10 days later and they are allowed to go for a walk in the convent park. And her, you can see that her mother has a lot of attitude against all the rules and regulations. And her mother's quite a piece of work. And she gives her a friend from the same small town is also at the convent school and the mother of our protagonist gives a birthday present to her daughter to pass on to this neighbor girl. And it's a book. It's a children's book. And there's no religious anything in it and our protagonist is so tempted to read it but there's the re what they're allowed to read in the convent is strictly controlled and she decides she's gonna surreptitiously read it before she passes it on to her friend and she gets caught by the mother superior and she gets disciplined and that was just heartbreaking the, the discipline is because it wasn't a Catholic author. It wasn't uh, approved literature, and it was just really well done. I'm really enjoying it so far. I didn't know anything about Antonia White until I looked her up this morning, but yes, quite autobiographical, and um, she had a very colorful life. She was kicked out of a Catholic school as a 15-year-old because she was writing a novel that she was writing as a gift to her father, <laughs> and it was discovered, and it was so irreverent and dark or whatever that she was expelled and she didn't write again for 20 years. She didn't write a whole lot but this is her best known novel and she had a very dramatic personal life. Three husbands I think and 
One of her daughters wrote a tell-all kind of mummy dearest type memoir after Antonia White died in 1980. This is really touching and I think there's going to be some lesbian stuff happening in a, in a chapter or two. A new, beautiful, slightly older girl has joined the convent so I have a feeling it's going to be about her. It's going to be with her. Oh, thank you. you. You're not interrupting. I'm, I'm, I'm making a video, and I'm. This is not live. There's no problem. All right. And the last book that I'm gonna t talk about, even though I think. No, I'm gonna skip that. I'm not gonna talk about the fourth book. I think I need to read it a little bit more before I check in on it. So stay tuned for that. Instead, I'm going to tell you about the books that I'm gonna start next week. <laughs> I finished two, I'm going to be starting four. Let me talk about the ebook first. This is from this month's book spin. And I'm so happy because it's a woman in translation book. So it's going to be an addition to what I talked about in my TBR. It's probably going to bump something on my TBR, but that's fine. I really want to read this book. This is a memoir by a Uyghur woman. I think maybe an activist. It's called How I Survived a Chinese Re-Education Camp. And the author is Gobahar Haitawaji. And the co-author, and I might ha have it reversed, but I think the co-author is Roseanne Morgat. The translation into English is by Edward Govin. And it's been on my TBR forever. I have the ebook, and it got picked. That number on my list got picked for this month. So it's perfect for Women in Translation Month. You know, don't get me started on how evil China is. And one of the atrocities. One of the main atrocities is the genocide they're perpetrating on the Uyghur people. So this will be my first book that I've ever read about it. And, you know, I'm expecting to be horrified, but uh, hopefully enlightened. I am starting this novella, this Canadian novella. It's actually a Western Canadian novella, The True Story of Ida Johnson by Sharon Reese. I read this after I went to her reading in Edmonton, I think, is it dated? Not dated, but probably in 1989, something like that. I went to hear her read from this book and answer questions and so on. And this is one of the picks that Barb Howard, the Calgary novelist, picked for our novella discussion. And I was absolutely delighted. So I found my copy in a box on the farm. It's in, still in pristine condition. And there is her. She signed it. She has just died a couple years ago, which was sad to hear. She was a real uh, feisty, in-your-face <laughs> character. I'm going to reread this for my discussion about novellas with Barb. I enjoyed it very much the first time. Looking forward to reading it a second time. Also for Women in Translation Month is this novella that was on my TBR, the accompanist uh, Russian novella by Nina Berberova and translated from the Russian by Marion Schwartz. And I believe this is doubly translated. I think it was trans first translated into French, and that was by Marion Schwartz. And then the English translation is by William Collins. I might even have this finished by next week. And I'm really excited to start this Inuit novel, Sanak, by uh, Midier Jip Napaluk. And I'll, I'll research the pronunciation so that it's not terrible by the time I check in on it. And this is also a double translation. First, it was translated from Inuktitut to French by Bernard Saladin Danglour. And then it was translated into, from the French into English by Peter Frost. And somebody, one of my commenters, uh, told me that there's an audiobook. And I checked as soon as I saw that comment. And it's um, available to me. This will definitely be an audio text combo if, as long as I get along with the audio narrator. But I believe that commenter said it was great. That's all I'm going to say about it, but I'm really stoked to start. I had a beautiful interruption just now, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it other than that it was a, a chance meeting with a stranger, and we ended up having this really great conversation, exchange contact details, and I'm hoping she'll come on my channel. That's all I'll say, but it was incredible. It was an incredible conversation. It's the kind of spontaneous 
meeting of somebody who might become an interesting person in my life that I've been trying to open myself to, and it just happened in the middle of filming this Friday read. So how beautiful is that? Yep, that's what I got. I'm just in such a great headspace. I hope I can uh, transmit it through the airwaves or whatever, the YouTube waves to you, and it intensifies the fabulous reading life you're already enjoying or sparking it to manifest. Oh, Sean, just stop talking. Thanks for watching. <laughs>